Assalamu alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now I'm delighted to be joined today by Meretia Labidi, who has taken time out of her whirlwind speaking schedule to talk to me in our studios in London. Meretia Labidi is the Deputy Speaker of the Tunisia Legislative Assembly in a country which is credited with sparking the start of the Arab Spring. She is also the Global Coordinator of the Women of Faith Network. She's also co-chair of Religions for Peace, and she's been dubbed the highest ranking female political figure in the entire Arab world. Assalamu alaikum, Meretia. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Welcome to Islam I, Channel. I, I'm so glad to be with you. Now, you've been described as having been catapulted from almost total obscurity <laughs> into the center stage of Tunisian politics. Uh, you're now billed as the, as I said in my introduction, as the highest ranking female political figure in the entire Arab world. From your humble position as a uh, university lecturer who lived in France and enjoyed French citizenship just over a, a year ago, and as a woman in a traditionally male-dominated uh, society, where your public profile only very infrequently grabbed the headlines. I noticed, uh, for example, in your battle uh, against President Sarkozy's attempts to restrict the wearing of the face mm -hmm. veil in France. Uh, how did you suddenly find yourself in such a prominent role in Tunisia? And are you, as one newspaper suggested, a liberal Islamist? <laughs> First of all, uh, it was, I was not in total obscurity. Indeed, I was um, uh, very active uh, in interfaith dialogue and uh, uh, working also with many organizations uh, to uh, empower women. Uh, but you know that Tunisia, nobody was, uh, ha has had the right to be on the public scene unless uh, he or she received the permission from the late dictator. So I'm so glad and uh, also uh, happy that I was not known in this political scene dominated by the dictatorship. Uh, but uh, now, um, as uh, a woman who grew up, of course, and lived for years in France, but I am uh, also one of these uh, uh, young person who uh, uh, are from the trend, the Islamic Muslim movement in Tunisia and especially in Nahda uh, movement. So I learned, I learned too, too, too much with the, the activists of this party, men and women. And uh, you know, of course, poli politics is a male dominated uh, word and uh, field, but uh, Tunisia is always exception. And uh, I think another party is exception because uh, women have been involved since the first years of the party in, uh, in elaborating its vision, in being activist, and you know, many women, among them, some of my uh, friends and sister-in-law were imprisoned and uh, they fought against and resisted dictatorship. So we maybe have been personally catapulted. Catapulted. <laughs> catapulted, <laughs> sorry. This, yeah, this is a wonderful word. Yeah. No, uh, just uh, I think I, uh, it's by the grace and the blessing of God and the will of my people that now I am in this constituent assembly. And uh, it's my honor. And also it's I know it's a responsibility to have been uh, chosen by my party and also by all uh, the representative of my people to be uh, the deputy speaker of the assembly. Uh, it's the normal way of uh, uh, things uh, since uh, if you if people do know Tunisia and also the uh, the endeavor and the effort made by Tunisian women also to have a say in economic, social and political life. So, and as for the title, uh, liberal Islamist? <laughs> well, for me, I'm Muslim women. Liberal, moderate, uh, traditional, this is not very important. I'm Muslim women, Muslim and modern women. Excellent. Now, in your role as global coordinator of the mm. Women of Faith Network, you've 
been pioneering for years the role of women of faith in a range of networks in 30 countries uh, across Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, the Pacific, Europe and uh -huh. soon North yes. America as well. Um, now in your presentation this week at Chatham House, which I was delighted to attend, you expressed the sentiment that the role of women is paramount in Tunisian politics. For the benefit of our viewers, it's worth uh, noting that now in Tunisia women hold 28% yeah. of the seats in the, in the chambers of deputies. And to put that into perspective, the figure in the UK is something just short of 25%. So essentially, you're ahead of us in the UK. Uh, in America, I think the number of women in the US Congress is about 17%. So mm -hmm, you're mm -hmm. ahead of that. Um, so how significant an achievement is this? And do you expect the role of women to continue to increase? Um, of course, I expect and I will uh, help it progress the role of women and be also more effective uh, in Tunisia. But first of all, I have to pay tribute to all these women from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, and especially my African sisters. I learned a lot with them and working with them, these women, and uh, they are really powerful. And through their example, I discovered um, the power of women as agent of peace and reconciliation in their society, especially when this society um, uh, uh, undergo uh, a crisis or, and, or upheavals like the revolution in Tunisia. And uh, this is why I do believe that Tunisian women, whatever is their ideological position, political choice, or generation are a force of reconstruction in Tunisia. And I'm quite happy and quite proud to say that uh, these women who are 28% of uh, the members of the assembly are not just, uh, um, let's say, decor, but uh, they are acting uh, very, very um, uh, positively within the uh, constitutional committees uh, to draft the constitution within uh, the legislative com commission to uh, promulgate, to vote new laws. And uh, we have some examples of our sisters in this uh, assembly. Uh, they are really tremendous. Like, for example, Mrs. Yamina Zoglami. Mrs. Yamina Zoglami is a former political prison. And uh, now she is at the head of the ad hoc uh, commission dealing with the martyrs of the revolution, uh, the injured people and all the victims of oppression in the last two decades in Tunisia. And uh, uh, she is really a powerful uh, woman. And uh, the leader also, the chair of the Commission on Liberties and Rights is a woman. The vice chair of this commission is a woman. And the vice reporter of the rapporteur of this uh, commission is a woman. So you see, women are very active in our assembly. So really, Tunisia is a model for the emancipation of women worldwide, then? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> now, you, in, in Chatham House this week, you praised <laughs> the achievements of the Tunisian revolution, uh -huh. a revolution which you described as having taken place with limited bloodshed. Um, yeah. You weren't saying that there yeah. wasn't bloodshed, mm -hmm. but you said limited, mm -hmm. and one which has managed to witness the construction of the apparatus of a democratic government in an unprecedented timescale, within 12 months, when traditionally most revolutions uh, do not see any form of stable government in place for at least a few few years, three even longer years. You celebrated the success of managing to build a coalition representing all the colours, you said, of the political spectrum in Tunisia. Would it not be fair to say that the smooth transition is largely due to the fact that the apparatus of government, uh, the structures, the personnel, the individuals uh, that were there under Ben Ali are more or less still in place, are still in their jobs. Isn't that mm, true? Yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, Tunisian uh, revolution uh, indeed have uh, been very, uh, let's say, um, wise in dealing with the, the structure of the state and the administration. And I shall say that uh, the continuity of the state we due it to the fact that our administration is solid. And of course, many people who are working under Ben Ali are still uh, continued to work and some of them are still working in our administration. 
what uh, I have to um, also to precise is not not all of them were corrupted. Many of these people are patriots. Many of these people continue to work to save Tunisia, but just, justice shall also be uh, done. And uh, uh, if uh, all the people who were proved corrupted, they are now uh, out, or they are, they are, they have trials. And uh, of course, we are continuing this effort. Uh, to, um, um, let's say, to uh, eradicate corruption from our administration. But uh, Tunisian nature is for progressive action and not for, for, for cleansing, uh, 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 let's say, aggressive cleansing, because um, maybe this is also the nature of our people. We are um, of moderate nature. Of course, we have excessive and abusive behaviors or attitudes, but uh, there is a tendency to moderation in uh, even in our revolution. Well, when I was in Tunis just a mm -hmm. couple of months after the revolution started, uh, a year ago or so, um, I remember I met with civil society leaders and members of unions mm -hmm. and, and uh, human rights organizations and also some school teachers. They, they talked about many instances where, where people suddenly were pushed out of their roles, who'd been mm -hmm. obviously appointed via what you would describe as a corrupt, corrupt mechanism, and other appointees were put in their place. Uh, I got the overall impression that there was some sort of system of cleansing going on. Um, would mm -hmm. that not be the same in government as well? Um, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, f f there is a fight or combat cont against uh, corruption, but um, we want to respect law. It's not uh, because uh, that the dictator has never respected law, and be have treated unjustly uh, many Tunisians. That now we are going to use the same procedures. We want to use uh, legal procedures and be sure that anyone inside this administration or out of it who is corrupted and who harm who anyone who has harmed Tunisian uh, in their dignity or who have uh, who who had uh, uh, stolen their money and their wealth will be uh, for sure um, judged and for that and and will there be a a process of accountability as well as punishment? I mean, are we going to see truth and reconciliation like in um, South Africa, or is it going to be...? We are setting a pr process of transitional justice. And we have a Ministry of Human Rights and Transitional Justice. Uh, and uh, at the Assembly, we have set a commission, this commission on uh, also corruption and uh, uh, administrative reform. Okay. Now, one would be forgiven, uh, especially when I heard you speak so eloquently at Chatham House, for thinking that all was relatively plain sailing. But uh, I've read a few reports which suggest that things are not going as smooth as you might like it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's talk of a huge swathe of opposition parties in Tunisia's constituent assembly merging into much bigger blocks in an attempt to mount a stiff challenge to the Enada party, which you represent, uh, which then obviously is by far the, the largest of the groups. Um, I've also read about the intentions of the secular movement, uh, intend to make a play for power with their natural leader, uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, Beji Kadja Asebzi. Uh, yes. uh, the politician who stared the government through uh, the transitional period, uh, expecting to make a comeback at the age of 85. Um, and there's a third block even uh, um, emerging, which includes former members of Ben Ali's ruling party, uh, uh, uniting behind the legacy of Habib Berbigia. Burgiva. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, now, the father of Tunisia's independence. It seems that the principal concerns amongst the opposition are, uh, is playing on are that the Tunisia is sliding, they say, towards some sort of theocratic regime. Uh, and that this is what they say has forced them into regrouping in order to balance the two main forces. They say on the one side they've got the Islamists who want to implement Sharia and on the others the liberals who want a democratic, modern and secular state. Is that an accurate picture of <laughs> things? When we uh, 
talk about uh, smooth smoothness uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, in Tunisia there is uh, no uh, real transition in minds in, in attitudes and no one uh, say that uh, uh, democracy democratic uh, transition is a long and uh, calm li river no no it we have movements and we are Mediterranean and uh, but what I want to say is that it's normal it's normal that uh, the opposition uh, is doing their job as opposition. Where have we seen an opposition uh, supporting the majority or the coalition in power? And as far as um, the gathering of uh, many parties in in small bl uh, in big bigger blocks, I think this can be good for t young Tunisian democracy because you know after the revolution we have more than one hundred party. It's too much. So if they gather, maybe this, this will give efficacy and uh, uh, to uh, the political life uh, uh, in Tunisia. And uh, as far as the fears for the emerging of uh, theocracy, well, this, these fears are not justified because uh, Tunisian people, whatever is their choice, Nahda or any other party, there is a consensus on a civil state. And let me, for example, take the example of Islam. If the if, if this if the the fear is coming from the fact that the reference of Nahda is Islam, even in Islam we have no theocracy. A state has always been a civil state in Islam, a power of men, governing men, but the reference is Islam, is our uh, Islamic values. And, uh, well, uh, we have a program with the coalition, and you know that the coalition is made of Nahda, but also the Congress of the Republic, Liberal Democrat, and of Etakatul, Social Democrat. So already we have difference, we have diversity, but we have common concern and consensus in this coalition. If we have a strong uh, opposition, okay, that's good for the democracy in Tunisia. And the discussion and the debate is there, it's open. And we are also building a new Tunisia in which uh, each group, each person can express freely his opinion without uh, being afraid that be, uh, that the police will arrest him or he will prevented will be prevented by someone or some power from uh, expressing himself and uh, also de determining his position and his attitude vis-a-vis -vis no. the government or any other power. Now you mentioned that there are over a hundred parties registered and that you thought that these blocks might be a good thing um, but it's fair to say that uh, th this weekend in fact mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, over 52 of these opposition parties mm -hmm. are coming together for a major gathering uh, in the town of uh, Ber Burguiba, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mon Monastir, um, to to rally and to, and to to meet and discuss uh, in a in a in an attempt to build one of those quite substantial blocks. Is this sort of uh, movement um, going to unsettle any of the what you've re described as a smooth transition? No, I don't think so. I think that now we have um, first of all. Uh, uh, strong will among Tunisian people never to go back uh, to enforce the rule of the law. If these parties respect the law, if they organize themselves according to the law, Tunisian law organizing political parties, and if they have nothing uh, to blame, yes. to, or to be blamed on them, Okay, they are Tunisian citizens, they can organize, but provided that they enter the political scene and the political, let's say, game, when, and respect the rules, the rules for democracy, the rules of transparency, and the rules of the respect of the will of Tunisian people. Now, there's been some described about what some have described as the fledgling government's 
average performance, they say. <laughs> they say in a country riddled with unemployment and poor health care. Uh, now, you hinted at uh, the, that your party was reasonably open about acknowledging that there have been some shortcomings in that regard. How important is it for your government to get on top of those big issues of unemployment? Let's be honest, uh, it was, after all, the economic failures and the poor health care that led to the huge upheaval in the first place over a year ago. Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the reasons of the revolution is bad economic situation. But uh, no one uh, expects, I think, that uh, miracles after the revolution, and we cannot, in a post-revolutionary phase, uh, suddenly realize uh, a very rapid recovery of economy. But uh, what I can say, what, what is the government is doing? First of all, the government is doing a complementary budget. And this budget is dedicated, first of all, uh, to raise money or to raise means also and to take measures to help uh, poor family and uh, to improve health care and, of course, to create jobs, to create employment. and. Uh, to launch um, uh, development, regional development programs and projects. Uh, we will discuss this complementary budget in two weeks maximum. Uh, s and the government also will uh, present its, uh, in detail its economic program. Uh, and uh, I think this government is working now three months. It's quite reasonable delay to uh, have achievements or to start uh, these achievements. So let's wait and judge the government for its achievement. Finally, uh, it goes without saying that Tunisia will for some time uh, remain dependent on international support. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that the Obama government a year ago pledged something like £42 million for both Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, you've got uh, the G8 countries uh, pledging, uh, talking about the World Bank, the IMF, uh, European Bank of Reconstruction and so on, uh, pledging £20 billion, uh, the Arab states even £10 billion. Um, how important uh, are, is it for there to be some deliverables from the government for the, this sort of support to continue? Of course, uh, the government uh, shall give signs that uh, its program is working. And if uh, there is no immediate result, at, s at least signs that the projects have started and the recovery is on. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the challenge for the international community is to help the Tunisian uh, experience of democracy, of transitional democracy, to succeed, because this success will be the success, the success of all democrats all over the world, and it will give Arab Muslim world an example of reconciliation between Islam modernity, Islam democracy, Arab world and democracy. It used to be said that the Arab world is the exception. No democracy in the Arab world. This is not their affair. But with Tunisia, we are proving that an Arab people can also be actor of building a democracy. And so that uh, I hope that uh, the support given to Tunisia uh, will not stop and will not really be conditioned because uh, uh, we are um, compelled to succeed. On and that, we cannot succeed alone. On that profound note, sadly, we are out of time. But I'd like to say, Mahrizia um, Labidi, the Deputy Speaker of the Tunisian Legislative Assembly, thank you so much for joining us on Islam Channel.